So today we're going to talk about water quality and why that's important and why we care about it with our fish and our trout in the river. But before we do that, we have to talk about pollution first. There's two types of pollution. What are they? Point source pollution and non-point source pollution. So point source pollution is tough because you guys, you out there don't see that as much as, as I did growing up because in the 1970s, we had the Clean Water Act and point source pollution is where we can point at the source of that pollution. So coming from a factory, dumping things into a river, we don't see that as much in the United States because of the Clean Water Act. So what we're going to talk about more today is non-point source pollution. And that's the thing that you and I and all of you out there can do something about. Yep. And we can help that get better. So non-point source pollution, there's a, a couple of different types of it. The thing about non-point source pollution is we can't tell where that came from. We can't point at it. So we have to try and figure out where that trash came from. We have to try and stop it at the source, which is us. There's different kinds of non-point source pollution. One of them is, is dirt, um, soil that gets in the river. We want dirt in the river. It exists naturally in the river. But if I brought a dump truck up right here and dumped a whole bunch of dirt into the river right here, what would happen to our fish? They'd die. Why? Because they can't see and then dirt would get into their gills too because they can't Yeah, they can't breathe. see, they can't breathe when there's a bunch of dirt in the water. So we'll talk about that. There's also toxic chemicals, things like motor oil. Um, if you're changing your oil in your driveway or your parents are changing their oil in the driveway in the car, please tell them to recycle that oil and not just dump it down the storm drain. How can you recycle oil? Oh, you can take it to the place where you bought it. They have to recycle it. Um, but where does it go if you put it in the storm drain? Around here, anyway. Where does it, goes it go? Straight to the river. Yep, and it kills the fish. So we don't want that those toxic chemicals in the river. Um, nutrients, things like plant food, which are good in small quantities, and we're going to talk about this with the water quality, but in large quantities, not so good. Also, this lovely thing. Hopefully, you can see this. This is poop, and there's lots of interesting things in poop, one of which is nutrients that are good for our fish and our river. Also some bad things. There can be toxic chemicals and bacteria and things in here that aren't good. Um, is then, there a oh, poop that's worse than other poops? Definitely. Dog poop is really bad. So if you have a dog and you're walking your dog, clean that dog poop up. And it's because of what they eat that is so bad. Same, same reason that human poop is so bad. Um, because we eat things that are not going to be good when they're broken down in the environment. So we don't use dog poop or human poop as fertilizer. Mm -hmm. We use cow poop, vegetarian animals that are only eating plants. Um, so they have lots of nutrients in their poop that are good for growing things, but too much in the river and we get sick and dying fish. So that can be a pollutant. Thermal stress. That's a hard one. Do you wear thermals when it's cold outside? Yes. What are thermals? They're an extra layer to keep you warm. So thermal means heat and temperature. So again, think of that dump truck. If we brought a dump truck up to the river with boiling water and dumped it in right here, what would happen to our fish? All the fish would get cooked. Yep, too hot. They do not like hot water. So that can be a source of pollution. Um, pathogens, germs, bacteria, things that can get in the river usually, again, through poop. Um, cow poop, if they have some harmful bacteria like E. coli, the kinds of things that we find on our romaine lettuce sometimes, and we can't eat it anymore, that's not good in the river because the fish don't like that. And last but not least, good old trash. Recycling goes in here too. That one, again, we don't know where that can came from. It's a good example of non-point source pollution, but we know we don't want it in the river. So be careful of your trash, clean up your trash. What we're going to do today is test some of these things in the water and see how clean our water is. The kit, test kits we're using today are low cost water quality testing kits. They're super easy. You can buy one of these for $15, $20 on Amazon if you want and go test water to your heart's content. Um, 
So these aren't super scientific, but they're fun. They're easy to get a good idea of a basic water quality measurement. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sydney to start with that. So when we're talking about the health of the river, it's hard because it's the middle of winter, so nothing's growing right now, but you can look around at a river and kind of evaluate the health. There's definitely lots of trees that will grow and leaf out in the summer. Um, the water looks relatively clean. Don't see any fish, but I promise you there's fish in there. So just eyeballing it, we can guess that our water quality is probably pretty good. There's no smell to the water. There's no obvious big pools of bubbles, of soapy bubbles that we sometimes see in ocean water. There's not a lot of trash around. So I think just looking at the river, we can estimate that the water quality is going to be pretty good. We can do it, let's do it. Temperature is important for water quality because it affects the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water, the rate of photosynthesis, and uh, the rate of photosynthesis by aquatic plants living on the water floor, whether that be like a riverbed or under the ocean or in the lake. The temperature can affect the sensitivity of organisms living in the water to toxic waste. Um, and also, temperature relates back to non-point source pollution with thermal stress. Yep. Okay, uh, so what's our temp? Our temp is... I have about 10. I have about 10. Okay, so that's Celsius. And if we want to convert that to Fahrenheit, which we're more used to, um, the simplest way to do that is just to add 32. So we've got water temperature of about... 42 degrees Fahrenheit. 42 degrees. Which is great for the fish in our rivers and for trout in particular. Because they like about that temperature of water. Yes. Okay. Cutthroat trout prefer 39 degrees Fahrenheit to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, while rainbow and brown trout like it a tiny bit warmer, 44 degrees Fahrenheit to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this is perfect. It's completely perfect. We have happy fish mm -hmm. with the temperature. Okay, what's next then? Dissolved oxygen, uh, which relates to a temperature. By having more dissolved oxygen in the water, the colder the water is, which I already stated, and less dissolved oxygen in the water when it's hot or water. Dissolved oxygen is important in our water because fish need oxygen to survive, just like other living creatures, they breathe through their gills. So cold water holds more oxygen than hot water. Yep. Okay. Uh -huh. So for this test, which we've already done because it takes a little while. Yeah. Um, we have dissolved some chemicals into this water and we're going to measure the number that we think it is on our little chart. Mm -hmm. And I'd say about four. About four. Okay, four parts per million, which we, then we take that, and since it relates to our temperature, mm -hmm. we use this little chart, which you have a picture of up on the screen. Yep. Where we look at our temperature, which was 10, and we go across to four parts per million, and that tells us the oxygen saturation rate in the water is at 35%. Yep. Now, if that were true, we'd have no fish. Nope. They'd all be dead because that's not enough oxygen. So we know there's fish in there, right? Yeah. We know the fish survive. We have a good, healthy population of fish. So something went wrong with our experiment. There's a couple things that can go wrong with this. One, we have to have, because we're measuring the oxygen in the water, we don't want any excess oxygen in these test tubes. And when I turn it over, and probably yours too, you can see some tiny little air bubbles floating up. Yep. So we have some extra oxygen in there. The other thing is these chemicals, once they expire, they don't work. So this is a good time to talk about how science sometimes doesn't work. We look at this, we know there's more than a 35% saturation rate in that water. So we know this is wrong and we can evaluate why and learn from that as well. So that's important. 
Next, we're going to talk about nitrates and phosphates. There's still a tiny bit to say about dissolved oxygen. Figures. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, dissolved oxygen can fluctuate, though, throughout the day and over oh, right. seasons. Um, the amount of dissolved oxygen in water will increase due to wind, waves, and plants producing oxygen. Because it's shoving oxygen into the water when it's windy. Yep. That makes sense. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about now nitrates right. and phosphates, which can be found in fertilizer, um, in your plant food, in the fertilizer you use on your lawn, the fertilizer that farmers use to grow crops, golf courses use to keep, keep them lovely and green to play golf on. So phosphates and nitrates are good in small amounts. We need them in the water, but if we get too much of a good thing, then we have a problem. It's just like if you drink too much chocolate milk, you will have a stomach ache. Mm -hmm. So we don't want too much of that in the water um, because then it sucks up all the oxygen. So these two chemicals, when we get too much of them, we can see an algae bloom, which we do see around our rivers and lakes, sometimes in the summer times when the water, water gets hot. Um, we end up with too much of this stuff. We get an algae bloom and then as the algae dies, the microbes breaking it down, use the nitrates and oxygen in the water, and then there's no oxygen for the fish and we have a dead zone. So it's a tricky little balance with nitrates and phosphates. We want a little bit, but not too much. So these two tests, this is the phosphate test. And so we want this to be pretty low. I would say it's between two and four, mm -hmm. which is too high. Way it's too a high. lovely, beautiful blue, but we don't want it to be quite this blue. So that's a little bit of a problem. Let's check our nitrate, which has been in a darkened sleeve. It's much better for a while. Still a little green, but I'd say about five parts per million, which yeah. is too high. Again, these are probably high right now because we're in the middle of winter. Um, the water has been low, but we've had a lot of runoff. And one thing that happens with phosphorus, phosphates, there's a lot in the soil naturally. Mm -hmm. So when we have a flood event or when the water right, comes up and we have some soil erosion, we end up with a lot more phosphates in the water. Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes some sense right now. There's probably snow melting on agricultural fields. We can also get nitrates and phosphates in poop. Um, and so there's probably, that's probably why it's a little high right now. So I'm not super concerned about it, but it's not great, um, but not terrible. Okay. The next thing is turbidity. <laughs> so turbidity is the measurement of the clarity of the water, which is just how clear the water is, how easily you can see to the river bottom. Can you have the dirty water that's clear? Yes. Um, because there can be bacteria and pathogens in the water that we can't, can't see. see. That's why you don't drink river water, even if it looks really clear, because yeah. there's things you can't see. So same thing with like iced tea, mm -hmm. which if you hold up a glass of iced tea, you can see through it. Yep. So it's not turbid because mm -hmm. there's not particles floating around, but it might not be as clean, clear water as you want it to be. Exactly. Uh, the original test for turbidity was discovered, created, yeah, invented. The original test for <laughs> turbidity was invented in 1864 in the Mediterranean Sea, and it's with the use of a Secchi disk. And the Secchi disk originally was uh, pretty much a big white plate that they lowered into the Mediterranean Sea and saw how deep it went before they couldn't see the disc anymore. It probably didn't go very far because there's a lot of salt in that, a lot Sadly. of dissolved particles. But in 1899, they decided to kind of switch it up a bit and make it easier for fresh water. And for some reason, that meant making it black and white. Is, um, is there a good example of where you can see a long way with one of those black and white Secchi discs? A great example of clear water would be Tahoe, and it has one of the longest running streaks of like high, I mean, low turbidity levels. Because it's so clean and clear. Because Yep, because it's so clean and clear. So they go out on boats and drop these discs down and measure 
how long it is before you can't see it anymore. Yep. And the higher the turbidity, the less light that is reaching the river bottom or the lake bottom. So that means your aquatic plants are getting less sunlight and creating less oxygen. So that would affect dissolved oxygen and which affects fish in turn. Everything comes back to that dissolved oxygen. It yeah. seems like. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to test the turbidity of, of our water. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're going to get a picture of later. Yep. So let's each check it and see what we think. So we have a little key yeah. here yeah. that you'll see a picture of. I would say our water is a little yellow, but it's fairly clear. But yeah. only tap water would be a zero, mm -hmm. which it's not. So I, I'd say it's between zero and 40, maybe 10. I'd say 10. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty clear water. Okay. Next is pH. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the acidity of the water. So we have acid and basic. So one end is super acidic, and that's, ironically, the number zero is acidic, and the scale goes all the way to 14, and at 14, it's the opposite end and very basic. So this is confusing unless you talk about it with food. So can you tell me an acidic food? Lemons. So if you cut open a lemon or a lime or an orange, any citrus fruit, and lick it, it's, it's acidic. Yes, I don't even know how else to explain it. It just kind of makes you cringe and it's difficult to stomach and um, some people love that, but that's very acidic. So what's the opposite end food? Milk. Milk. So if you have a stomach ache sometimes or if your parents are complaining because they ate a bunch of spicy food and they feel very acidic, if they drink a glass of milk, it'll help settle that down because it's very basic and it will calm that acid down. So same thing with our water. Um, we want our water to be right in the middle. Our fish like it there. We, our bodies like it there. So right between 6 and 8, 7, 7.5 is where we want our pH for river water and drinking water to be. So I'm going to go ahead and do this one by putting this tablet in here and shaking it up. And it's going to turn nice and bright green. Mm -hmm. Which you'll see in the picture Which on the we screen. Want. And I would say it's right where we want it to be between seven and eight. Yep. This is exactly how we want it to look. And if we took, if we sent you home with one of these tests to do on your tap water that you drink every day, we'd want it to be this exact color because this is what humans want too. So it's weird that it's green, but that's, that's how we want it to look when we test it. So the pH of our river is, is pretty good. So all of these tests, what can we conclude about our, our river? Our tests were, our temperature was good. Our DO was not good, but that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, our turbidity is pretty good. Yeah. Our, and our nitrates and phosphates were not great. So we have a fairly healthy system, but some issues, which I would expect. Um, our water is definitely has some pollution issues, which we did talk about last week in the watershed segment. Um, not that those things, the mercury would not show up on any of these tests, but we would expect to have some pollution. We have a lot of cows on our river. Um, we have a lot of sediment, um, a lot of snow melt coming off of fields with animals on them. So there's lots of, um, there's gonna be some poop in the river, things yeah. that, that cause that. So, but overall, it is a very healthy system. I have a question. Yes. What do we do? Because we use these chemicals to take all these tests. What do we do with this water? That's a good question. So we do not want to put this water back in the river because it has chemicals in it. So whenever we're doing this testing, and if you ever do this testing at home, we dump it into a safe container and take it home and pour it down our sink where it will at least get to a treatment plant and the water will get treated before it's released back into the water system. Good yep. question. All right, we'll see you next time. See Bye, ya. guys.
All right, so we have a couple questions to start off. Um, let's see. Someone said, how warm is the Carson River? So like, what is the temperature of the Carson River? Well, you're Sydney. Okay. Um, that was actually, it, we went over it. It was the first thing in the video, but it, it's easy to miss. Cause again, it was the first thing in the video. Um, the temperature on the day that we took the temperature of the water. So the day that we filmed, which was last Friday, um, it was about 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty good, even though it was a warm day, um, the yeah. water temperature was, was where we'd want it to be. Okay. Um, going down, sorry. Um, do trout live in the river? Yes, they do. Uh, I'll just answer that one real quick. Um, um, is the well water cleaner than tap water? Well, that depends. Oh. I mean, it, can't answer that one way or another. It, it depends on on your own well. And um, the important thing, I guess, to know is that you know, testing is important. And our, our water, um, where we get our drinking water, those agencies are testing water constantly to make sure it's safe for us to drink. And if you have a well, um, you should be doing that as well. But it, it's too variable to really answer that, that question. Good question, it's just hard to answer. Hmm. All right. Someone said, how long has the Carson River been in Nevada? I don't know if they mean like, um, how long has it been, you know, consistently here? I don't know if any, you know, that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's again, I think we had this question last week. It's kind of about the geology um, of, of our planet and, and our region in particular. So the river has likely been here pretty much as long as the geology of the area has been here. Um, I don't know how to answer that question any better than that. That's okay. That's a tough one too. <laughs> All right, well, it's okay. We'll move on. Um, so next question is, how do our trout handle the difference in temperature between our classroom tank and the river? Um, Ooh, that's kind of- Dan question answer that one. Yeah, I was gonna say that's kind of our, more on our end. Um, so you want me to take a stab at that one? Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think um, our, um, in, it's inevitable um, in nature, the wild, um, that we have inconsistent flows, we have inconsistent temperatures, we have lots of things that happen, uh, happens. Um, I think the snowstorm um, this last, couple of weeks is, is a really good example and then it all melted um, went right back into the river so that that is definitely cold water um, if that's the water that's entering the system um, so I think the um, I would say that the biggest effect it's going to have is, is our ability to know when they're going to hatch so having the ability to keep that um, steady water temperature um, that consistent um, water temperature allows us to understand a little bit better about that. Um, whereas I think they're gonna be affected as far as timing, most likely a little bit more um, and may out, not in the tank. Um, I, I think they probably have, I hate to say it, a better chance um, of, of with the water quality specifically um, in, uh, out in the wild opposed to in our tanks because I think it's pretty easy for us to um, introduce stuff on our hands, um, whether it's hand sanitizer or there's a, a lot of different things that's pretty easy to get in into our tank. And although we um, we have more water in the wild as opposed to in our tank, so it's easier to disrupt a small amount of water opposed to a large amount of water. So I would say um, hopefully that answers it um, just between those two. Awesome. Um, this is kind of another one that might be directed at Jim, but how many types of fish are in the Carson River? Um, so up high, um, we have, I would have to imagine real high, you might find some brook trout. And as you come down, most likely it's going to be LCT rainbow trout, uh, depending on which, um, which fork as you make your way down out of the mountains. So 
um, most likely brook brown rainbow um, cutthroat. Um, and then as you kind of come down into the valley um, where they merge and, and go into Carson, um, you have more warm water species. So you have more uh, smallmouth bass, uh, carp. Um, there are some rainbow trout planted in town um, that do survive um, most of the summer, but uh, excuse me, most of the spring, but by the time the temperatures really go up and flows drop, we lose those. So really once you hit the uh, car city going downstream, it's, a, it's mostly warm water. So carp and bass. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone said if there's less oxygen in the water, will the trout sink a lot more? Um. <laughs> Um, my bigger concern would be that they would not have enough oxygen to breathe. I think they're asking, would they float more because they have more oxygen in them? And honestly, yeah, because they take in air into their air bladder to, to sink or to float. So it's an interesting thought, but they probably yeah. die before they would start to sink. They, I yeah. I mean, it, and fish, I think, are, well, I don't know. I'm, my, an, guess would be that fish are way better than humans at controlling floating and sinking. I mean, that's what they do all day and they're swimming around in the water all the time. So yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, and then someone asked what predators are in the Carson River. Oh, I can imagine what eats our trout. <laughs> well, uh, Jan, do you want to take that one? I mean, I, I'm more comfortable talking about what critters are going to hunt them from the outside of the river um I, I almost think caitlin or amanda might be easier better on this one or who did the the predators and that was me that was um amanda. so are in the carson river i don't know necessarily about other fish but other fish that are larger than our trout are definitely going to be predators of our trout um, I'd say the number one predator probably within the Carson River that's going to be going to the Carson River and hanging around that area are, are going to be birds. Um, we have so many fish eating birds um, and they definitely love hanging around bodies of water with, where they know that there's going to be fish hanging around. So I'd say the number one predator for our trout um, the Carson River are going to be different fish eating birds. Yeah, almost every time we are down there where we were filming, we see a bald eagle, lots of hawks some herons, all the, yeah, that's exactly why they're hanging around, Those yummy fish. There's Someone's there. asking why can't trout have too cold of water or too hot of water? Just like any animal, they're going to, they're going to be sensitive to those um, changes, just like we are. Um, we've adapted to changes in temperature by, with clothing, um, and the amount of hair and fur on a on an animal's body um so fish are, are gonna be picky about what kind of temperature they're comfortable in i mean they can handle some fluctuation and and you all at end are gonna be better at answering that than than we are but they don't want it to get super hot um definitely yeah i think you covered it pretty well animals are adapted to live in a certain habitat and that does include temperature um, and if it gets too hot, they, they won't be able to survive, you know, just like how we can't survive um, out in the heat for like out in extreme heat for a really long time. I'd imagine our fish can tolerate extreme heat for short, short times, um, but not that extreme of heat because like we said, they'll begin to cook. Um, and then same thing with getting cold, uh, the body's metabolism starts to shut down, just like how it does in our body. Um, and so animals can't function. Huh? What happens to the fish when they get whirling disease? We'll let you guys handle that one. Dan, do you happen to know about whirling disease? Oh, you're muted. I don't know a lot about whirling disease. Um, I do know um, basically what happens, and I guess I can describe that. Um, they're affected, I believe, um, early on so it it's um i guess it would be kind of during their um, um during their growth if they get it um i don't think it's something that that affects them um i, I think it affects 
small fishes are growing um, more than it does large fish. But essentially what it does is um, it affects their um, spine. So they essentially don't have a straight spine and they literally swim in circles. Um, so the fish can't, um, uh, let's see, we talked about um, last week, Jessica talked about the pectoral fins for steering um, and using different fins for different things. And essentially they use that ability. So um, the caudal fin can still push them, um, but the rest of the fins having the bent spine just don't work right. So they literally um, swim in circles. It's pretty sad, very, very sad. And then another question for you, Jan. I think we already covered this, but always good to go over again. Uh, which river in Nevada has the most trout? Um, so I think on just sheer size, probably the, tr the, the Truckee because of the size. Um, but I would say um, uh, the, the most productive water that I know of as far as has the best uh, populations for size, um, I'm actually going to go with East Walker. Um, in some areas on the East Walker, specifically like the Elbow, there's, there is more fish than you can count. So a um, little bit of a, a haul um, to drive, but um, that's a, a great spot with a lot of fish. Uh, when fish die, do they sink or float in the water? Mm. They float. Um, the gases in the body, the, as the body begins to decompose, it releases gases, and those gases are trapped within the body. Um, so then they rise up in the water, and they typically float, hang out until they wash up on shore. I'm having flashbacks to my childhood goldfish tank. Where, <laughs> you know, the, the, you wake up in the morning, and the fish are floating on, on top because goldfish are so hard to keep alive sometimes. So that's what made me think of that. Um, someone's asking if fish sleep. Do you happen to know that one? I think they do. I think they, they have um, like unilateral sleep patterns, which means that they shut down one half of their brain to sleep at a time. So they're still moving, but they shut down one side of their brain, I think. I feel like I remember. I want to say that that's, that's, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's how I don't it know works. if it's all fish, but I, I remember learning that about certain fish. So, um, is there, you said, I think you mentioned briefly in the, in the video that like a little bit of like high nitrates possibly like caused by poop could be good for the water. Um, but you don't want too high of nitrates because definitely fish poop into the water. So there is poop going into the water. Is there any way that poop could be good for the water? Well, yeah, I mean, poop's a tough one. And we talk about it a lot with water quality because it's a huge issue in our rivers, with the, in any river with critters. Um, but nitrates and phosphates are good in small amounts because they help things grow. That's why we use them as fertilizer um, and why farmers use them to help plants grow. They need those. Um, nitrates and phosphates to actually produce the things that we eat. So we want some of that in the water because it helps those aquatic plants grow. But when you get too much of it, um, it's difficult to break down and it takes oxygen to break for the microbes to break those things down. So they're sucking in that oxygen. Then our fish don't have enough oxygen. And that's why it's such a tricky balance with those chemicals. We want some, but not too much. Um, our tests were a little high that, that particular day, but not alarming to where I was going to feel like I had to call somebody and say, get down here right now and figure out what's going on. But um, so all things in moderation, perhaps, is the way, the way to answer that. We want some, but not too much. So there are good, some good things in, in poop, more in cow poop than dog poop. Again, we want you guys to clean up that dog poop there is never a good reason for dog poop to be in the river. Um, cow poop, a lot of it, again, not good, but some of those nutrients that come from that poop are not a completely terrible thing. But overall, there's probably more bad things in poop than good. I mean, we don't, <laughs> we're really having an interesting conversation. We really don't want a cow to be pooping right in the river. It's not a, not a good thing. Um, but if some of those nutrients and, and things wash down and get into the water, it's not a terrible thing. But parasites, there's other things 
um, in there that, that we don't want in the river at all. I mean, we definitely don't want large quantities of E. coli and parasites and, and things that can kill animals and people um, in the water. And it, it happens. We get, we do get high E. coli counts at times. Um, and that's not a good thing. All right, and then we have someone asking, uh, which river has the best temperature for trout? Which I would imagine it'd be the one that kind of swings in temperature less, the one that has more like stability in its temperature. So. And wouldn't that be the one that's flowing most consistently? Because like the Carson, you know, can dry up and there's going to be any water, it's going to be very shallow. So I'm waiting. fed rivers. Um, I would say that the best one is probably the uh, collection ditch in the Ruby Marsh. Um, so it's all, it's fed year round by springs and the water comes in at a constant 49 to 52 degrees. So it's year round that temperature. That's it. I think that's, yeah. Good question. And someone's asking how many lenses do fish have like in their eyes? Um, they definitely have one lens per eye. So total they'll have two lenses, but one in each eye. And someone's asking how thick fish eyes are. Um, they're really not that thick um, at all. I'd say maybe like half an inch to an inch at max if we're just talking about your basic trout, like half an inch probably. Um, is there a certain season that has the best temperature water for fish? Oh, in like the know. summer, it can get kind of Yeah, hot. I mean, if it gets too hot and the water gets shallow, I mean, that's what we worry about with the Carson mm -hmm. because it is the, I mean, not seasonal, but I mean, it, it definitely is going to dry to a trickle in the summertime, especially when we don't have a lot of snow in the winter to melt. And, and then it doesn't melt at a consistent rate. So um, it's going to depend on the, the flow. And I mean, let's see, we were what, February, and our temperature was pretty good, even in the water's up a little bit. But I don't know, Jan, would you, is winter? You're muted. <laughs> All right, I missed the first part of that question. What was it? Is there a season? on our rivers that's gonna be the best temperature for our trout. Oh, the season. Um, so I, I would, I'd go with the spring and fall for temperature. So um, the, the trying to get that, it's hard for the river to stay. Uh, it's hard for a river like the Truckee, for example, or the Carson, um, uh, staying cool as it reaches down into the valley floor. So um, really in the spring and the fall, you're closest to that at 50 degree mark, um, just because of the outside temperature is closest to that. Um, we have someone asking if trout would eat the feces that get into the water. Um, I would imagine, yes, they cannot differentiate between whether or not that little speck is a piece of poop or a bug. So they'll probably just go for it regardless, but I'd imagine they probably don't like it. Um, what do trout eat? We've discussed this a couple of times. Their main diet is going to be other fish, uh, insects, those macro invertebrates we talked about the other day, um, crawfish, and sometimes snails and leeches and worms and things. And then how well can fish see? Jan, do you happen to know how well fish can see? Um, I would say pretty well. Um, and, um, I, I can tell you that when the water is very, very, very crystal clear, um, especially when that temperature is, is prime, um, so the fish are happy and they can see everything, um, I catch a lot less fish. Um, my favorite conditions, and I, I can say that I absolutely catch more fish when the, uh, the water's a little dirty, so when they can't see me. So um, that for me from, I guess, um, personally, I would say that that's enough proof for me to know that um, they can see pretty darn well. Um, and almost, um, if you take your arms out and kind of put your arms back as far as you can, if you reach out and as far as your shoulder blades to go back, it's about kind of what they can see. So everything from that, those points 
moving forward, everything they can see there. So they have a little blind spot behind them, but for the most part, um, they, they see very well. Um, and then which river in Nevada is the most polluted? I don't know. Probably, not. I would say the Carson, um, mostly because, I mean, there's, there, they all have some different elements of pollution, but um, the Carson has within its watershed two Superfund EPA, Environmental Protection Agency Superfund sites, which means they're being studied intensely to try and clean them up. Um, and, and they are significant. Um, I don't know, Jan, if you would agree with, with what, I mean, we always say not to eat the fish from Dayton downstream, but um, we're also kind of informally advised by the EPA not to eat the fish in the Carson anywhere. Um, so it's fairly polluted, but there's pollution issues on all the rivers. But I think I'd say the Carson is probably the worst. I, I don't have an answer for that one. Um, I think I can almost, um, I can almost kind of find a reason with each one of the rivers why there's, there is definitely pollution, which, um, uh, you know, the ours, we, the size of our city and the, the, the treatment plant putting back in and, you know, we have, um, we have a lot of problems that definitely have increased our pollution, um, especially in the city this last couple of years. So, um, you know, the Truckee, I, I think, is, is kind of in bad shape too now. So um, if nothing else, this might be a good, good, good time to point out that we need to fix that. <laughs> um, if we're arguing which one's more, more polluted. Um, yeah, so to, right? This is uh, not a good thing. And again, we go back to that non-point source pollution. I mean, you and I and the people out there watching, I can't do anything about a, a factory that has a spill but I can do something about reducing, reusing, recycling, um, trying not to throw things away, picking up my dog's poop, not dumping oil, motor oil down the storm drain. Just those little, little things, using less plastic, throwing away less trash, um, all of those things, if we're all doing those things, that can, those are the things that we can control and help, and they help the river ultimately. Someone's asking what river has the least amount of fish. I can't answer that one. That Whichever one. river I'm fishing, for the most part. <laughs> I, I believe that, actually. <laughs> um, I would say that actually, um, you know, the, the whichever river dries up. So the Humboldt um, below Rye Patch or the Carson stretching down, um, there's, there's definitely water that dries up. So um, the fish, the water that, the, the rivers that completely dry up obviously are gonna have no fish, but um, even less than that when they're, when they're pushed into small pools or areas. Um, so I would say Humboldt and the Carson is probably a pretty good, good example of that going, going east. All right, so it looks like that was our last question. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you River Wranglers for joining us as well and uh, giving these, these lovely videos. You were really well done. Um, Thanks real for quick, having us. Uh, Jan, did you wanna update on the live stream on the tank? Have you had a chance to look at it? Yeah, we will real quick. Um, some of the information is, is a little outdated that's on there, but at this point, um, I'm gonna touch base with Abby again today to make sure we're all on the same page, but I see um, eggs still, but a little bit of movement. So it looks like they're just kind of starting to pop. Um, so I think our um, worst case scenario happened. I think they're about four weeks behind or three and a half weeks behind our fish that are in the classroom. So, um, uh, they're, they're a fresh batch of eggs. Um, so if you check the live stream, you can see a little bit of movement here and there, but for the most part, they're pretty still. Awesome. All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And we will tune in. Let's see. Next time is Tuesday. And we're excited for that one. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>